Papua New Guinea is still trying to deal with the impact of the landslide that hit the, hit the country on Friday. The government fears 2,000 dead, a figure with much higher than the UN estimates. Rescue efforts are underway, but the treacherous terrain and adverse weather are posing complications. Will the rescuers be able to save the survivors? Our next report telling you more. In the early hours of Friday, as most people slept, a landslide tore through Papua New Guinea. Some villagers say it felt like an exploding bomb. The government fears 2,000 have been buried alive. The United Nations, however, puts the figure at 670. Six villages have been affected in total. More than 150 houses have been buried beneath debris. Some even two stories high. Take a look at these satellite images. This is what the affected Inga province looked like before the disaster. Now, it looks something like this. You can imagine the extent of damage here. The government ordered thousands of residents to evacuate from the path of the landslide. Even after four days, the landslide remains active. Rescue efforts are currently underway. But the treacherous terrain is making it difficult for help to arrive. Rescuers are battling in the face of adverse weather conditions and the risk of further landslides. To make matters worse, a bridge has collapsed on the main route for shipping aid and equipment to the site of the landslide. If the region experiences any more rainfall in the near future, it could lead to another unprecedented disaster. This is what an expert had to say. It's an extraordinarily complicated relief operation because leaving aside the fact that it's a very remote area, um, this was not only a very significant landslide, but the terrain is continuing to move. So my team that were actually at the site yesterday, they said they could even feel the ground moving under them and the ground moving around them. It's much more slowly. For the time being, such parties are relying on manual labor. The locals have been desperately trying to locate the survivors. They are using sticks and bare hands to dig through mud. They are trying to rescue whatever they can uh, by using digging sticks, spades, agricultural forks, and their hands, of course. I have 18 of my family members buried under the debris and soil that I'm standing on and a lot more family members in the village I cannot count. I'm the landowner here. Thank you to all those who have come to help us. But I cannot retrieve the bodies, so I'm standing here helplessly. Those who were fortunate enough to find the bodies were seen mourning their loved ones. Provincial authorities have requested the international community to send engineers to carry out a geohazard assessment. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has also expressed grief over the disaster. He says that India is ready to offer all possible support and assistance. Bureau Report, we on. Wild is one. Shifting focus now to Bangladesh. Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina made a rather big revelation. She claimed that a foreign power has offered her a hassle-free re-election if she allows them to build an air base inside her country. You heard that right. Now, this offer is essentially in exchange for a seat for the air base. In fact, although she did not reveal which country made that offer, it does raise serious questions about who would be bold enough to intervene in another country's democratic process just to build an air base. And what strategic interests does this foreign power even have in making such an offer? Why did Sheikh Hasina not mention the name of the country? After all, it has to do with the integrity of democratic processes and so it is concerning. And here's what we know so far. Hasina, who has been ruling the strategically located country since 2009, secured a fifth overall term in election in January. And on Sunday, the Daily, Daily Star Bangladesh, the Daily Star Bangladesh, quoted Hasina as saying, if I allowed a certain country to build an airbase in Bangladesh, then I would have had no problem. 
like East Timor. They will carve out a Christian country, taking parts of Bangladesh and Myanmar with a base in the Bay of Bengal. Now, she did not name the country that had made the offer to her, but emphasized that the offer, quote unquote, came from a white man. So how did Hasina respond to that request? The Bangladesh Prime Minister said that she gave the same reply as she did in 2001 when the U.S. offered to sell the country's gas to India. She said, and I'm quoting now, I've clearly said that I am the daughter of the father of the nation. We won our liberation war. I don't want to come to power by renting part of the country or handing it over to some other country. And I don't need power. Hasina says that she told the said foreign leader that she will only come to power if the people wanted her to. The Bangladeshi Prime Minister further said that trade and commerce have been going on in the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean since ancient times. She said that many have had their eyes on this region. She said that the region has never seen controversy or conflict and vowed that she will not let conflict happen over the region. The revelation by the Bangladeshi Prime Minister undoubtedly leaves a lot of room for speculation. Given the geostrategic advantage of Bangladesh, it's not surprising that a foreign power would want to build an airbase. The question is, who would be so bold as to interfere in its poll process? Could the US be considering building an airbase in Bangladesh to counter China's power? Would having an airbase in Bangladesh give the US a significant advantage over China? Sheikh Hasina has accused this foreign power of wanting to carve out a Christian state like East Timor using Bangladesh and Myanmar territory. After all, the Bangladeshi Prime Minister's re relationship with the US has been strained even before the recent elections. But as the leader of the free world and one of the oldest democracies, would the US really make such an offer? And if it wasn't the US, then which other country will actually benefit from disregarding the democratic processes in the interest of building an airbase? We don't have the answers, only questions. Sheikh Hasina may have put the matter to rest for now with her prompt response. But is the danger really over? Time now for Gravitas Recall. On this day in 1937, the German automaker Volkswagen was founded to mass produce a low-priced people's car. The company was originally operated by a Nazi organization. You heard that right. The company, in fact, was originally operated by the German Labour Front, which was a Nazi organization. The Austrian automotive engineer, Ferdinand Porsche, who was responsible for the original design of the car, was hired by the German Labour Front in 1934. But World War II broke out in 1939 before mass production could begin. During the war, the factory was repurposed to produce military equipment and vehicles. Volkswagen's military involvement in the war made its factory a target for Allied bombers. By the end of the war, the factory was in ruins. It was in 1946, after the war, that under British supervision, the factory was rebuilt and mass production of the Volkswagen started. In 1949, control of the company was transferred to the West German government. By that time, more than half of the passenger cars produced in the country were Volkswagens. In the following years, Volkswagen production expanded rapidly and as they say, the rest is history.